This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hi, welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. And today in studio, we have Zeb Weiss, and he is the Executive Director of the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. It's a pleasure to have you in studio today. Glad to be here. And so today we're going to talk about the Kentucky Nature Preserves. But before we do, tell us how you got interested in the environment. Well, I think like uh, a lot of people in Kentucky, I grew up wallowing around in the creeks and in the woods. I'm at my uncle's farm, just generally uh, skipping rocks and catching frogs and all that kind of stuff. As I got older, I, I retained that interest. And when I came to UK as an undergraduate, looking around what I might major in, I, I, I settled on uh, zoology over in the biology department, um, just because I wanted to be outside and mess with critters. Um, unfortunately, they uh, got rid of that major when I was a oh, sophomore, yeah. so I was kind of grandfathered in. <laughs> After that, I, I started working at Raven Run Nature Sanctuary here in Lexington and went on to work for the state. I worked for state parks. I worked for state fish and wildlife before I landed here with Nature Preserves. And then somewhere along the way, um, I hooked up with uh, Dr. Tom Barnes because a lot of what we do in, in natural areas management, of course, is invasive species, and that was a big interest of mine and of his. And he eventually uh, brought me into UK to come back here in the forestry department to get my master's degree working on invasives. So it's just kind of a general, you start off playing around in the woods and liking it, and then you see uh, where there might be some room for improvement and trying to fix some things, and that's kind of how I ended up here. Great. So tell us what you do as executive director. Well, I go to a lot of meetings, <laughs> which isn't much fun, and worry about budgets. But the good stuff is um, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves has a broad range of programs that involve uh, preservation and conservation of natural areas, which with a focus on rare species habitat, kind of un unusual ecological areas like old growth forests or native grasslands. But we look for the places that people have really monkeyed with least in the mm -hmm. state of Kentucky. We have about 25 million acres in Kentucky and we are involved with about 90,000 of those acres in our, in our various programs. And that ranges from, we own state nature preserves, about 50 of them throughout the state, like Blanton Forest State Nature Preserve is our, is our largest old growth forest in Kentucky and in, in Harlan County. We own and have hiking trails on that. We also have uh, partnerships with state parks. Most of the large wooded parks like Natural Bridge, Cumberland Falls, Carter Caves. We uh, uh, cooperatively manage the natural areas of those as dedicated state nature preserves. We also run the state's wild rivers program. So there are nine wild rivers. <laughs> There's nine <laughs> specific stream segments in Kentucky um, with no, uh, no dams, no uh, bridges, no roads. They're really about as wild as they get left in the state and um, we make sure those riparian corridors stay wild. Um, a lot of that is within you know Mammoth Cave National Park, Daniel Boone National Forest. We own a few properties that protect those wild rivers and then probably lastly we have our Natural Areas Registry Program where we work with a variety of private landowners and even public landowners, it's not really a protection as much as it is a recognition. And that's a long answer, but uh, mm -hmm. I ended up with that because one of our more recent projects that I'm, I'm pretty active in, I'm pretty excited about is, you might be familiar with the Abbey of Gethsemane, which is actually a, a monastery mm -hmm. in Nelson County, which has been owned by the monks since the 1820s, I believe. They've had it for a long time. And we have just recently enrolled them in our natural areas registry program. And we're gonna be conducting prescribed fires on some of their property. They have some glades and grassland remnants that are very interesting and unique. And so I get to have my fingers in some of the good stuff as well as uh, all the administrative stuff. Well, you said you just <laughs> enrolled them. So how does it qualify for an area? Well, that's a great question. We have about, what do we have now? About 30 employees. Um, so I. 
I mentioned earlier there's 25 million acres, so I joked mm-hmm. that with our last few hires, we finally have less than a million acres per person. <laughs> and a big part of our job, of our biologists, is to look at aerial photographs, look at modeling, and try to figure out areas that have likely habitat for rare species or rare community types. I believe uh, Tara Littlefield, our, our lead botanist, is going to be with y'all here in a, a little while mm-hmm. um, to talk about that program. But there's, there's a, a greater likelihood there's going to be rare or unique features out in the country than downtown. Mm-hmm. So um, Gethsemane is one that's been a uh, single owner for a long time, had kind of consistent land management use, had a lot of interest. So some of our ecologists over the years has gone and spent time on the ground, ground to truthing, and has found interesting remnant grasslands and interesting remnant um, native species. And so we've worked with them for a long time uh, on this designation, and we finally came to came to terms. We write a lot of grants. We work with the State Fish and Wildlife Department, State Forestry, to come up with projects. And we finally devised a plan to help them. Actually, we will conduct prescribed fire, like I said, things like that, mm-hmm. to help them manage their area. And, you know, that's part of their mission as well to manage um, and be good stewards of the land. Mm -hmm. So that's just a really interesting project. And again, we work with just private landowners who have the same interest. We get calls fairly frequently from folks who are landowners, farmers that say, well, you know, I got a a place on my back 40 that's just kind of cool and I'd like to protect it, but I don't want to sell it and I don't want to do anything like that. So we try to work with folks like that to help find programs to to help them manage in a a kind of preservation style uh, management plan. Hmm. Okay. We, we're actually involved with like 150 different sites and they, they vary greatly. So there's the ones we own and then there's the ones where we co-manage, which is the bulk of them. But we have something or other in 72 counties where we're involved oh. to some degree or another. Until so all across the state? All across the state. Okay. So yeah, I mean literally we have three ponds, State Nature Preserve is on the Mississippi River. And we have things in Hickman and Fulton County. Mm-hmm. And then the Pine Mountain Trail, we have a lot of areas on Pine Mountain, all the way to Pike County. We're involved mm-hmm. with Breaks Interstate Park to some degree, up in Greenup County. I mean, we're literally pretty much everywhere in the state. Some, we again, are the single manager. and We spend a lot of time there. Other ones, it's more like a conservation easement where we're just kind of overseeing the management or making sure they... They manage under certain parameters, Mm -hmm. but it's really broad. And is the public allowed to come to these places? Are there some where they are allowed? The vast majority are open to the public. We have hiking trails. There's a few that aren't open to the public because the habitat is very sensitive, like Mm -hmm. uh, certain wetlands or or glades, grasslands. But our goal is to eventually acquire enough property around them that even we can Mm -hmm. have them all open to the public someday. But we actually, earlier in 2019, we um, came out with a new website that has location maps and how to get to all the places that have hiking trails and all that. So we encourage folks to go there to figure out how they can get to these places because part of our mission is education. And in the best way to educate folks about preservation and about habitat is getting them out there walking around in it, <laughs> not yeah. just talking about it all the time, yeah. but to enjoy it. So we encourage that. We, we want to make them more accessible. To folks. Okay. And so for our listeners kind of here in the central Kentucky area, is there one that is your favorite or that you recommend they visit in this area? I just can't. Everybody always asks me my oh. favorite. It's <laughs> uh-huh. impossible. But I will say if I narrow it down to uh, central bluegrass area, I'll say our largest one is the Tom Dorman State Nature Preserve on the Kentucky River in Garrett County. It's only about 30 minutes from New Circle, mm-hmm. right off of Highway 27. Um, when you cross the Kentucky River. We just put in a new parking lot actually last week <laughs> and we have uh, and added about a mile and a half of trails. So we're up to like, I think, f- six miles of trails altogether. Um, so that's that's the largest one. And I'm, we're pretty excited about our new p- trail project there. Um, Pilot Knob State Nature Preserve is right outside of Clay City. Um, if you hike up to the top of Pilot Knob, it's a couple miles round trip and you and supposedly you are standing where Daniel Boone first saw the bluegrass region after being lost for a couple of weeks in the mountains, he climbs up there and he sees, hey, it's flat over there. Somebody could farm. And mm-hmm. so that's the, the settlement of Kentucky started there. I don't know if it's true or not, but I like it, so we tell everybody that. <laughs> uh, Floor Cliff State Nature Preserve is actually a private nature sanctuary here in Fayette County. 
that's part of our program. They do, I say private, but they do regular educational programs and do guided hikes and they do a lot of good programs. And again, uh, Raven Run, which I'm sure most folks in this area are familiar with, is part of our natural area registry program. And we actually helped expand Raven Run about 15 years ago, double in size through our Heritage Land Conservation Fund program that we administer. And we're going to be working with them on uh, some prescribed fire here in the next month or so. So they're all my favorites. I, I, I could just <laughs> name every one of them, I guess. But I guess each one of them have some kind of unique feature. They right? do. They do. Um, so it makes it hard to pick because <laughs> each one is, is different. Right. You can see good stuff on all of them. Mm. Um, even, you know, if you're a biologist, every one of them is literally different. You can see a lot of things that are different from one to the other because they're all subtly different. If you just like to go out in the woods, there's some people that want to go to the same spot over and over again and just really get to know it. We have some very dedicated, regular volunteers that are like that. Other folks want to go hike in a new place every week. Mm. Uh, and again, we have uh, 100 plus hiking trails in our system um, for people that want to do that. And again, they're they're all cool. They're all good places. That's why we put trails on them. We wouldn't have trails on them if they weren't worth uh, looking at. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the biological assessment tool that you have. A big part of our mission is to identify and locate rare species in the state of Kentucky. I, I mentioned earlier that we have a whole botany team that goes and, and looks for rare species and identifies endangered plants in the state of Kentucky. We also have uh, an entomologist that goes out and records rare insect species. We, we do rare bats. We, we locate all these species. Um, that's part of our mission. But then, and then what? <laughs> so we have a database where anybody can go and find uh, the rare species in their, in their area. Um, really, it is mostly designed for, for developers or people doing a, a project that is going to impact the environment in some way, building a road, building a utility line, something like that. They can use the biological assessment tool to, to kind of draw on their project. It's, it's ARC uh, GIS ESRI based, and uh, they can find what their project might impact and in some cases, when they're developing a project, it can, it can literally be nudging their project over 100 yards. They might not be going through that, that glade because it's a very mm -hmm. small restricted area. They might not be going through that, that habitat. It, it, sometimes it's not really that big a deal. So we use it as a, as a way to get our information out there and, and hopefully make a difference on some of these development projects. Just this week, we have added some free layers on this mapping tool where folks, again, can can find our natural areas and our trails. So we've added kind of a, a more general population uh, user-friendly uh, layers to it as well. And that's just rolled out. And that's something else that you can access right from our, our main website. And we can post that link yeah. on our That'd web awesome. page. Yeah. Again, we want folks to know, uh, know how to get all this stuff and know how to find out more easily. You mentioned earlier the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund. What exactly is that? Like most government programs, it's got way too many words. It has <laughs> it's Kentucky, a mouthful. It all has Kentucky mm -hmm. in it, it. People get these mixed up. The Heritage Land Fund is a program that's been around since the early 90s, and it is the state's primary funding source for conservation land. So funds go in the Heritage Land Fund from environmental fines, people that are polluting air or water. The fines go in the fund. For, it's collected by the state of Kentucky. Uh, people that buy the Nature's Finest license plates, those funds go into the, the Heritage Fund. So there's a board of directors. I'm the chairman of the board currently. They represent either state agencies like myself, the Department of Parks, the State Fish and Wildlife, uh, as well as private folks that are appointed by the governor who represent specific interests, like we have somebody that represents um, agricultural interests, like the Farm Bureau. We have another one that represents the League of Kentucky Sportsmen, one with the Kentucky Academy of Sciences. So people that are generally conservation or environmental uh, oriented, so they have all that money, right? Well, there are certain folks, certain organizations that it can apply to buy conservation land. And, you know, I've been talking about the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserve. So we use that funding to buy, you know, again, rare habitat, habitat for endangered species, things like that. Well, the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Department can also apply, and they can use that funding to expand their wildlife management areas. Mm -hmm. State parks can apply and add 
additions to parks for hiking trails. So they're not all exactly the kind of properties that the state nature preserves would fund, but they're kind of a broader view of what conservation is. We still don't fund things like ball fields, and we don't do things that are in that kind of outdoor recreation sense. The, the phrase is outdoor recreation in its natural state. So no matter who buys it, the land, it's still mostly used for uh, hiking and bird watching and, and things of that nature. But that's the program that to date, I think as of end of the last fiscal year, so the end of June of 2019, we'd funded about $77 million worth of projects hmm. statewide, and that's that 90,000 acres really that, that we're involved with. When an area is purchased using heritage lands, the Heritage Land Board has a conservation easement on that property. So folks from our staff go out and monitor annually and make sure they're being used for those, those purposes and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. budgets being what they are and land getting more expensive all the time, what we've done over the last few years is we have leveraged that funds with other programs. So we work, for instance, with the Division of Forestry recently uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Department on a forest legacy grant, which is a U.S. Forest Service project to help fund about 50-50, fund the uh, Big River State Forest in Crittenden County and Union County, which is about 7,000 acres. Mm -hmm. So again, because a certain amount of the funding is also used for habitat management and land management. That's how we build our trails. We implement our prescribed fire program to a large extent. We do invasive species management. So all that stuff is out of this uh, one fund, really. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. This is Dr. Matt Springer. I'm an Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management within the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at University of Kentucky. I'm here to teach you a little bit about the animals that live in our forests, especially those here in Kentucky. For those of you who might just be joining us, each week we'll play a wildlife sound from our forest. Here's our sound for this week. Stay tuned towards the end of the show. We'll talk about this animal and why it is making that sound. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. You had mentioned that you had, what, 30 employees or so? Right. What type of degrees do they have to have to be able to help manage these areas and oversee them? So we have two branches. We have a natural areas and recovery branch, which mostly deals with the hand on, hands-on land management, all, most of the stuff I've been talking about, trails and uh, fire and all that kind of stuff. For the most part, they are, um, we have a couple with wildlife management degrees. We have some with biology degrees. We have uh, a couple that are from here in this department have natural resource conservation management degrees. Uh, things along the, those lines, a couple with master's degrees from, from here at UK and different places. Um, we have another section that's the um, biological assessment branch. We have, that's where entomologists and our aquatic biologists are. are. Mm -hmm. They have biology degrees, forestry degrees, really anything that's outdoors. I'm trying to think of what we don't have. We have outdoor <laughs> recreation degrees on staff. It's it, very, very broad. Mm -hmm. Until fairly recently, there was no such thing as a natural resource conservation degree. I mean, there wasn't anything that really focused on, on management in the style that we do. So I'd say biology and forestry are probably the most common degrees in our field. Mm -hmm. So once you buy this, this property, do all those people have to maintain it, or is it a cooperative effort with someone else sometimes? That's or a, both? <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a whole lot, of, whole lot of both. Again, we have... 150 sites that we're involved with at some level or another. Some we own outright, some we have easements on, some we co-own with another agency. There are very few uh, one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. answers to any of this. Mm -hmm. There are some small ones where we are the sole owner and manager and our, our folks do all the work and nobody else really ever sets foot on them. That's the exception. We do a whole lot of work um, with the Division of Forestry 
doing forest management, doing, again, prescribed fire, things like that. We work with State Fish and Wildlife Department a whole lot. We have some nonprofit partners like uh, Bernheim Forest we work with quite a bit, Kentucky Natural Lands Trust we work quite a bit, uh, and it's real mix and match. It depends on what part of the state we're in and what program that we're, uh, we're working on. The conservation community in Kentucky is not very big. And so when I look at the round at the folks we work with on a daily basis, a large number of them I went to grad school with here at UK, folks mm -hmm. at the Forest Service. We work with a lot. Folks at um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, folks at other universities, Eastern and Western, we work with quite a bit, as well as here at UK. Yeah, we work with a wide variety of partners on just about everything we do. And nobody, I think, nowadays can afford to be too isolated and do their own thing because mm -hmm. many hands make light work. That's how it all works. Right, right. We have some listeners out of state and international as well. Can you talk a little bit about Kentucky's biodiversity, just to give people a picture, maybe if they haven't been to Kentucky before, what are some of the, I don't know, the range of, of things we have here and some of the areas y'all focus on? Wow, that's a great question. To back up just for a second, I mentioned the, the biological assessment tool. Kentucky is part of something called the NatureServe Network. Every state in, in America has what's called the Natural Heritage Program. That's us for mm -hmm. the state of Kentucky. We all use the same basic software. We all use the same basic methodology. So when we're looking for rare stuff and figuring out where they live and counting them, we're using essentially the same methods that Tennessee is using mm -hmm. or that uh, Indiana is using so that you can compare back and forth you can kind of get a good idea. So Kentucky is where we're at the northern range of a lot of southern species and we're at the mm -hmm. southern range of some northern species just because of the, the Ohio River, because of the glaciers came down, you know, barely into northern Kentucky, not real far down, left some northern relics. So we're very diverse. You go our Three Ponds State Nature Preserve, Obine Creek State Nature Preserve out in the uh, Purchase region. A lot of people don't know we have these big cypress swamps and, and sloughs that look pretty much the same as Mississippi without the alligators. At least not yet. They might be here. Um, they got water moccasins, but no alligators. Then you go far east, of course, we got our hardwood species, our oak hickory forest. We have very extensive, I should say, we used to have very extensive grasslands that look more like what you would associate with the Great Plains. Those are very restricted. There's not many of them left anymore because mm -hmm. of uh, land use changes over the last couple hundred years. Uh, but we still have these little pocket remnants of grasslands. It's kind of controversial what the accuracy is of this, but a lot of people think that the inner blue grass was, uh, was oak ash savanna. So it was a little bit different habitat type. So we got a lot of diversity in structure and a lot of diversity in, uh, in community type. And of course, what goes with that is uh, diversity in, in species. We have, I think it's about 2,500 different native plant species from one end of the state to the other, including a couple that are really found nowhere else in the world, but Kentucky are, are federally endangered. Um, White-haired goldenrod is only found in the Red River Gorge, and that's it in the world. It, it was endangered, it was delisted recently, thanks to a cooperative project between us, I'll take uh, all the credit even though I didn't do anything, um, <laughs> between us and the Forest Service worked on that in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for many years to get that delisted. Kentucky glade crest, which in the whole world only is in Bullitt and uh, Jefferson County. We work with Bernheim and a wide variety of partners in that region as well for that species. Here's some kind of oddball. We have recently uh, entered into a two-year project. We're more than halfway done. Inventory all the land snails in the state of Kentucky. <laughs> and you say that and people go, what are you talking about? It's land mm -hmm. snails. But um, there's hundreds of species of snails. You go from one, one ridge to the next, there'll be different species. Snails don't get around much. Mm -hmm. They're a wide variety. And in the, about a year that we've been working on this project, we have about 800 new county records mm -hmm. where they weren't known from one county to the other. But we actually have a couple of species that are new to science that are being described that were never found before. And mm -hmm. we have at least one species that was uh, a candidate for federal endangered species listing, but through our project and through genetics, we've determined that it's actually two species. So the one that has been petitioned for endangered species listing is in Tennessee, and the one we have is probably uh, newly described to science. So there's a, just, a, I guess the point of all this is uh, we're pretty diverse, and even today, I don't think people realize that there's new discoveries being made all the time. I don't think people have any idea of what's out there. I mean, we don't have any idea what's out there. We're still looking. 
one thing we were mentioned a lot uh, by folks from that are interested in biodiversity is our muscle fauna. We have about, I think about 10 um, listed mussels throughout mm -hmm. the state, more than that actually. We have about eight in um, the Green River alone. But our mussel fauna, our aquatic fauna is very, very diverse. It ranks up there with any, any place in, in North America. Um, so anyway, there's just a lot, of, a lot of nooks and crannies of the state that have yet to even been uh, inventoried thoroughly mm -hmm. for all these different species. Our, our entomologist, um, who specializes in moths, is always finding new records constantly. And to some extent, because where she's looking, nobody ever knew one moth from another has ever looked. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of things out there. It's hard to even wrap your head around almost. So earlier you mentioned volunteers. So can people get involved to help you all with this kind of projects or? Yeah, we, um, we love volunteers. <laughs> we, we can never get enough. I guess mm -hmm. nobody can. But um, Do they have to have specific degrees or know how to do things or will you teach them or how does that work? We'll take whatever we can get. Uh, <laughs> Our volunteers are, are pretty broad. We had a, we have a, a dedicated volunteer recently that was a uh, a retired a database manager that helped us do some of this data work. So mm -hmm. she volunteered for us and did office work, which is tremendously valuable because we don't get a lot of offers for that. Um, but majority of our volunteers um, will help us do invasive species work. We'll go out and help us clear bush honeysuckle or pull garlic mustard or things like that. Um, we have volunteer monitors where somebody who lives nearby one of our sites just keeps an eye on the place and reports to us regularly if something's not right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be anything from occasionally you got the people want to mess it up for everybody else and you get the occasional trespass and stuff like that. But a lot of times it's just trail work needs to be done, a tree fell, things like that. And it saves us a tremendous amount of effort from our folks not having to just inspect every square inch of the hundreds of miles themselves. Mm -hmm. If we have volunteers that just let us know when something's wrong, that's very useful. The snail project I mentioned earlier is actually a citizen science project. We have folks uh, helping us do that from school groups to just individual people that are just going out and hiking around and sending us shells. This project particularly is just a matter of picking up shells that are empty. We, you know, we don't know, no snails were harmed in the making of this report. <laughs> it's just an empty shell and you send it in to us and we have uh, folks that are experts um, that we're working with that identify those down to species. So it's, it's super easy. We got a lot of kids that help with that. Mm -hmm. My kids love doing it. Uh, love because they feel like they're, they're doing something cool. They're finding something new and different and it's something that they can actually do. So mm -hmm. we have a volunteer coordinator that you can find on our website. We have a, a get involved page on our, on our website and she is always looking for help. We have, of course, a form you fill out because we're the government. <laughs> and um, you tell us what kind of stuff you're interested in, and, and we can find a place to put you to work no matter where you are. And you mentioned kids getting involved in some of the citizen science. Do y'all do any um, youth programming, or um, how do you get the word out to the, the young people? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that's something we're really have just now getting into. Again, our volunteer coordinator, she's only been on staff about a year. Her name's Maddie Heredia. Maddie is about equal parts uh, volunteer coordinator and environmental educator, yep. which is, is a recent thing for right. us. So Maddie actually goes out and does programs herself, a lot of uh, stream assessments, water watch type things, a lot of uh, iNaturalist is something that we're starting to show people mm -hmm. how to use more, which is, of course, a program where anybody can help inventory on a, on a basic level some of these areas. Uh, and she also works a lot with our partners that already have environmental mm -hmm. education programs. In fact, she is working with Dr. Crocker here in this department on some extension programs for invasive species for, for the uh, Emerald Ash Project and uh, Boar Project and things like that. So we, we try to do a variety of outreach programs. is just to get folks out on our own sites. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we have folks that don't even know there's a nature preserve uh, down the road from them. And mm -hmm. so Maddie's programs, to some degree, helps do that as well as educate. Mm -hmm. Just gets people outside. Right. Mm -hmm. We also uh, found out by looking on your website that you're going to have a nature summit pretty soon. What's that about? Well, we're pretty excited about that. Our natural areas manager down on Pine Mountain, Kyle Napier, brought it to our attention that over in the Clinch Mountain in Virginia, they had something very similar, a naturalist rally is what they called it, where they brought together 
citizens and professionals from all over the place just to basically go out. It's, it's kind of like a bio blitz, but it's more kind of a family friendly version. So they're not just going out and looking for stuff, but they're also just having hikes and doing fun stuff as well. It's a little bit of everything. So Kyle, of course, brought it to our attention and uh, Maddie has grabbed it by the reins and is organizing it. And this will be the first one this year. Uh, it's going to be based out of Pine Mountain State Park, but we're going to have field trips that go to Blanton Forest State Nature Preserve, Bad Branch State Nature Preserve. EKU is going to lead some programs at Lily Cornette Woods, which is also a, a heritage land easement site. Uh, and it, again, it's going to be a wide variety of programs. We're going to have everything from guided hikes with um, our botanists uh, to we're going to have bat netting at night with uh, State Fish and Wildlife Department. We're going to have uh, in night insect inventories with our entomologists. Um, so it's going to be everything from just normal kid-friendly nature hikes mm -hmm. to really learning how professional biologists do some of this assessment. So it's going to be it's going to be pretty broad. And this is the first one we've done. We're pretty excited about it, and hopefully it's going to be an annual event. Just check your website for more details yes. on that so, and to register. Uh, the agenda is, should be up on our website by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be held on April 24th through the 26th, which is the weekend after Earth Day. So it's kind of our, mm -hmm. our uh, agency Earth Day event. Um, but yeah, hopefully uh, we'll have everything up there here pretty soon by February. And um, there's going to be registration information. We're working with the state park on that. Everything should be should be on our website uh, pretty soon. It sounds like no matter where you live, there might be a location doing something. Is that right? Yes. Again, we're all trying, over the state. All over the state. You're mm -hmm. never you're never too far. Again, we're in seventy some counties. Right. So you're never more than a, a county or two away from one of our sites. And even if we don't have an ongoing program or something guided like that, um, again, yeah, we want folks to go out and hike around and enjoy them. Mm -hmm. well, you mentioned, too, that even UK's Robinson Forest was a part of your program. Yes. So Robinson Forest has been part of our natural areas registry program for decades. It was actually one of the first registered natural areas. And again, the, what the registered natural area designation does is essentially it's a recognition that that area is just something special. Mm -hmm. So Robinson, of course, is an island of mature forest surrounded by impact. Mm -hmm. it, it really it really sticks out as being an intact mm -hmm. forest, and it's, it's one of the largest intact forests in the state of Kentucky, one of the largest blocks in a lot of ways. Again, many of our folks went to school at, at UK, so mm -hmm. we're very familiar with Robinson and what it has to offer um, with the research opportunities that are there. It's a way that we can say that um, what UK is doing and the management there is significant. And, you know, we just appreciate the efforts going on to everything that goes on there. And you also mentioned earlier, as we were talking before we started the show, about working together with some of our researchers as well. Yeah. A lot of our sites are the only place that some species live in the world, much, much less in our system or in the state of Kentucky. It's important that research be done on our sites. And we try to work with researchers as much as possible. And over the years, we've had a lot of projects with the department. Again, Tara's going to, I'm sure, talk about this a little bit, but we work with Dr. Barton on uh, endangered plant and some wetland seep, acidic seep project for 15 years or so mm -hmm. in a site that is unique in the state of Kentucky and one of the only places that this particular species is anywhere around. So that's pretty significant. We work quite a bit with Dr. Lackey over the years and students from his lab on a variety of endangered bat inventories, things like that. We've worked with, uh, there's just there's just a lot. Again, we worked with Dr. Crocker here lately on a lot of our outreach more than ever. My professor as a grad student was, was Dr. Tom Barnes, and going back, almost all of our sites were used for in, invasive species research, ecological community research. There's just a lot. There's just a lot of things to, to talk about. But we're always interested in having folks do research again because mm -hmm. we want to know as much as we can about these places because that's how we manage them too. I mean we want to make sure our management is guided towards the best available scientific information. We kind of have dual goals when we manage an area. Part of our statute actually says we're supposed to be living museums so we're mm -hmm. supposed to be returning these areas mm -hmm. to our best guess of what they looked like when Daniel Boone was tromping around. Mm -hmm. So obviously we don't have uh, any information except for what we figure out. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our missions. And um, the thing that's kind of compatible with that is 
are rare and endangered species, making sure the habitat is good for them, which, you know, generally nobody does single species management anymore, which folks, I guess, used to do once upon a time. We're not really gardeners. Is You have to have a healthy ecosystem and get the whole system in shape. And so we need research to know what that system's supposed to be, what the functionality is. Mm -hmm. Well, you've presented us with a lot of great information, and we appreciate that. So what would be one or two takeaway items that you'd want our listeners to, to leave with today? I guess the two big ones, uh, the easy one is is go to our website to uh, find out how right I was about anything that I just said, <laughs> because all the right stuff is on the website. And again, that's where you can go to, to find locations where you can go out um, and see these places for yourself. And to me, that's really the big takeaway is we want people out to enjoy nature, to enjoy these areas that we work so hard to maintain, because if people don't get out and enjoy them more, Will, will they always be there? Will people always care for them the way they do now? So that's probably the biggie is just figure out where these places are and go check them out for yourself. All right. Well, thank you, Zeb, for joining us today. And if you'd like more information on what you heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned now for Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. You've been listening to From the Woods Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to Wildlife Sounds from the Forest. I'm Dr. Matt Springer, Assistant Extension Wildlife Professor in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Before I tell you what that sound was you heard at the beginning of the show, let's play it again for you. Okay, that almost sounded like someone screaming. It does, doesn't it? It's really a red fox that's doing oh, okay. all the screaming. Okay. Um, and that's one of the calls they use for alarm mm -hmm. and communicates that there's some either form of danger or uh, something has startled them in mm -hmm. some way, shape, or form. And it's, it's one that I've actually been hearing outside my house the last couple of weeks as these guys are becoming more active. So hearing them now is I am their hearing time? them now, and okay. so they're in town. Uh, we've got a pair that's at the Arboretum oh. on campus here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's some that are... Uh, uh, almost getting themselves in trouble eating out of people's hands over by the mall. Oh dear! <laughs> uh, last summer, uh -huh. so yeah, they're they're a, a fairly common urban suburban animal mm -hmm. that we have right here. A lot of people do run into them because they uh, do so well living with humans. Okay, so you said a pair. So do they stay together for life? They'll be looking for pairs right about now every year. So mm -hmm. their breeding season comes in in uh, early spring, mm -hmm. um, late winter. So okay. about end of January, February. Uh, and as they come up to that, the fox, like most dogs, are very social. So they'll start looking for pair bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, but those pair bonds are not necessarily held across years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they seem very playful. They are. That behavior and their ability to, that playful behavior, that ability to tolerate humans mm -hmm. comes from their intelligence level. They're a very smart animal. Uh, but it also has transferred over to folks in Russia and, and Asia are doing uh, domestic mm. uh, foxes that are now pets. Oh, okay. So that, that cute behavior does transfer over pretty well, okay. doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so dens, is that what they live in? So, yeah. So foxes will use dens during the day a lot of times uh, or at night. And it's kind of, they'll dig into the ground and, and create a den, especially um, when they have kit. Um, baby foxes are called kits. Okay. And they actually will stay in their den for about three to four weeks before they come out. Mm -hmm. um, they're born basically eyes closed, tiny little things. Mm -hmm. uh, and mom will stay in there with them, uh, nursing them for about three weeks. And raising the, those kits is actually done by both the male and females. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the male during that time when the female doesn't leave actually brings food back to her uh, to keep her going. Okay. Um, and then unlike other dogs, um, species or canine species like the coyote, where if something would happen to that female while they're raising those kits mm -hmm. and she's no longer around, the male will actually continue to raise those um, to, mm. to, a, to hopefully where they're adults and can support themselves. Mm. So how um, many do they have? So usually a kit, that litter is about four to six kits. They only have one a year. Uh, so you'll, as a lot of people, as they're probably hearing this, have seen them. They're very curious little things and come right up to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need to be cautious. They are rabies carriers. Oh, okay. So in, in Kentucky, they've been, we had one in uh, Woodford County last year that tested positive for rabies. Okay. So it's another reason not to feed them as much right. as, and cute as they are, as much as you want to, you, mm -hmm. you definitely don't want to do that. 
A lot of folks will see them pretty closely tied to their houses. Oh, okay. They like to use barns for denning spots oh. and under sheds. <laughs> and these guys, canines themselves, don't get along very well. The species, so coyotes, foxes, the the bigger the dog, then everything on every other canine underneath, it's in trouble. Okay. Um, they they'll segregate themselves um, pretty well if they can, but it's not like they get along. Mm-hmm. Uh, so coyotes, uh, though they do well with humans, foxes do better, and one of their refugia from coyotes is in your backyard. Oh, okay. So that's why they, they tend to be closely uh, aligned with human dwellings, mm-hmm. uh, especially in Kentucky. So you said red. So are all of them red, or do they have different colors? So red fox is the species, mm-hmm. and they get that name because their color mm-hmm. uh, is traditionally red. Mm-hmm. However, they commonly have uh, both melanistic and lewistic in the species, so white and black. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's also this tricolored spe- uh, subspecies that's up in Alaska. Mm-hmm. There's actually, their range goes from North America um, across into Northern Europe, Asia. Uh, and actually, our, our foxes came from uh, Asia during uh, one of the Ice Age, the glaciation events. Mm-hmm. They crossed over. Okay. So, so they've been here a long time. Size-wise. Tiny. Tiny. Well. Like a cat or are you, so like a house cat or are you talking? It's funny because you, with all those subspecies in the range, you have... Foxes can get up to over 30 pounds, oh. uh, but our subspecies does not get that big. Okay. Now, you're, you're looking um, slightly larger than a cat. Weight-wise, similar to a fat cat. <laughs> okay. So you're, they can get as small as five pounds as adults, but generally they're, they're going to be probably in the double digit, just into the teens there uh, for most of the animals that you're going to come across. Okay. Yeah. Well, they don't, not too tall either. Not too tall? Yeah. Okay. Do they get in a lot of trouble, though? Or they can. They can. They can get into a lot of trouble. They, they, their diet's very broad, uh-huh. uh, and they'll, um, they are a predator, uh, so chickens are mm. on the menu. Oh, okay. Uh, they can be eggs, fruits, uh, so they will get into your garden and can cause issues with many of the things you grow in your garden, mm. as well as the chickens you may have in your backyard, <laughs> and are capable of um, even eat, going after, say, newborn lambs. Oh, so okay. they, they are predators still. They may be cute, but they're dangerous. <laughs> Not cute and cuddly, then. <laughs> Not, well, I mean, there's that domestic strain that probably is. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. All right, well, thanks for coming in and talking no, about red foxes. No problem. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information on what you've heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.